Hello, it's Czech Tutor here of Attention Magazine. Welcome to Crucial Listening, the podcast where I speak with musicians and sound artists about three albums that are important to them. My guest this time is Hanako Omori, a producer from Yokohama, Japan, presently based in London, England. Hinako's new album, A Journey, is out now on Houndstooth. The thing I love most about this record is the very seamless oscillation between listener and active proponent of sound that I hear. So the record brings together forest bathing, binaural sound, therapeutic frequencies into a work that has electronics at its basis, these beautiful warm synthesizers that merge into new shapes like clouds teasing out of one formation and slowly drifting into another. Hinako's voice springs to the fore and then disperses into the landscape. It sort of swerves between these moments where Hinako is addressing you directly and then embedded in amongst the trees and the birdsong. Huge fan of the record and it was lovely speaking to Hinako. Uh, We touched on a lot of nice 90s child nostalgia bits here, some MySpace CD wallets and the three records she picked were really special too. So you can check out Hinako's work over at hinakoamori.com and also on her bandcamp, hinakoamori.bandcamp.com. Head over to attentionmagazine.co.uk forward slash crucial listening. Well, I, I will uh, collate all the links as per. And also, uh, crucial listening is accepting donations on coffee, ko fi.com forward slash crucial listening for that. Thank you for your support as always. Really hope you enjoy this conversation and Hinako's company as much as I did. Okay, this is Hinako Amori on Crucial Listening. Hello, Hanako. Welcome to Crucial Listening. Hi, Jack. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honour to chat. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on. So we're going to talk about your three important albums. Before Mm -hmm. we get to those, I want to talk about your new album, A Journey, which is out now on Houndstooth. So I want to start with something that caught my eye when reading about this record, which is Mm -hmm. therapeutic frequencies, which I know very little about. (laughs) I'd love, firstly, to ask about what your connection is with therapeutic frequencies, why they appeal to you and how you deployed them on a journey as well. Sure. Um, So also I just wanted to start by saying I'm by no means like a (laughs) scientist or anything like that. So I think what I, what I understand is just, is just what I've learned um, so far and I'm, I'm so keen to absorb more and been really interested in sound therapy um I'm, I'm sort of doing bits and bobs of research and that kind of thing this is so what i say now is just kind of what i understand just as a disclaimer cool. Cool. but um but i think my interest from it well I, I guess um i studied sound engineering at university and i've always been interested in sound and the different applications and i think my interest in the sound therapy side actually came from a gong bath that i experienced um when i was on tour just before the pandemic actually and it was just such a incredible experience. Have you mm-hmm. ever had one before? Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. It's Unreal. so nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It just how how do you feel when when you've experienced it? Like, what's your what's your take on it? I tell you, I was quite cynical because I was like, I've been to experimental sound stuff before, and the teacher mm-hmm. was like, "Look, after this, you're gonna get a gong hangover. Drink plenty of water. <laughs> this is gonna really hit you hard." And I was like, "Right, yeah, thanks," but. 
I was really affected and I did have、mm-hmm. a gong hangover. I felt incredibly slumbery afterwards,、mm, but、yeah. so grounded as well. What was、yeah. it like for you? Yeah, very peaceful. And、uh, I think it just came at the right time. I, I think it sort of spoke out to me when I needed it. <laughs> right,、um, right. It basically, I just felt my whole body reset and I felt quite cold when it was happening. Like, I think I just went into some sort of. I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I went, but I felt like I wasn't in the room, if,、mm. if you know what I mean. It,、yeah. it was such a beautiful experience and very calming. And I came out of it just feeling really refreshed, but also probably really. Yeah, quite probably quite knackered after the experience as well, in a way. But,、um, but yeah, it really, I think reset is probably the best word that I felt from it. I think、um, it had just come from a culmination of traveling every day on tour, and、um, we were having such a lovely time. But I think, I think the traveling side takes a bit of a toll on our bodies, which I didn't really. Realize maybe until I had this、mm-hmm. experience and I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> like it's right, something、yeah. just complete. It was just so healing. And I think I was really curious to find out more about it. And then when the pandemic hit,、um, I tried a sound therapy course online just just because I wanted to understand a bit further about it. And,、um, and I think that's how I started getting into researching different frequencies. And there's certain frequencies that correspond to certain brain states. And the ones that I was looking at were delta, theta, and alpha. So,、mm-hmm. Delta is、um, around 0.5 to 4 hertz, and it's said to contribute to healing and deep restorative sleep.、Um, wow. Theta is the next one up, which is 4 to 7, and it's said to be around creativity, meditation, emotional processing, REM sleep. And then Alpha is 8 to 12 hertz, and it's to do with relaxation and passive attention.、Um, so, I think I was really curious to focus on those three just because I thought, you know, all those states are really, you know, healing for us.、Um, so, I think I've been. Really curious to see how I can incorporate that into music. In terms of the album, I was looking at、uh, creating binaural beats within the synth drones, recording、mm. droning bass sounds but detuning one side. So the left side is, say, four hertz lower than the right side. It's really subtle and it's not like a massively audible difference, but I think it's enough to create that binaural beat and、um, yeah, hopefully. Promote a sense of relaxation. <laughs> But、wow. who knows? I mean, I guess, I guess until you listen, and if it has an effect, then, then wonderful. But、um, I'd be really curious to hear people's thoughts and how they might feel after listening to it. I mean, another aspect I think of the record which renders it so pleasurable, now I realise there's these other forces, I say, going on in the record as well, <laughs> which are no doubt causing this, this serenity and calmness. But your textures are. Absolutely wonderful. There's so many moments in this record that really make my ears prick up. I think I was listening、oh, to it earlier today in my、so、much. car. I think it's the end of Ocean where it sort of transits very elegantly into something that sounds more like sunlit and almost like a church organ. It's so beautifully done.、Oh, uh, thank you. That's so、uh, kind. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I wondered whether or not there are any particular. Bits of equipment, any particular synthesizers on this record that you found really useful to you in getting the textures you want e d or any p- bits of equipment that really came to the fore to you and became particularly, yeah, particularly useful to you?、Mm, absolutely.、Um, so there's three synths that I, I guess I pretty much use across anything that I'm working on. Right. <laughs>、uh, so the first is the Prophet 8, which I adore, and it's the first,、uh, the first synthesizer that I bought. So, I guess there's, a, there's an attachment there in a way.、Right. Um, but I, yeah, I just love using it and I love the sounds that come out of it.、Um, the second is the OB6,、um, which is another sequential synthesizer.、Um, again, yeah, I just love the sonics that sequential create. And the same with Moog.、Uh, the third one is、um, the Moog Matriarch, which is a synth, I, probably the most recent synth that I've gotten to know. And、uh, it's a beautiful semi modular、um, analog synthesizer. And I think, yeah, all three of them feature on the. Well, it's j- the entire album is those three synths. Right, wow.、Um, oh, cool. And yeah, I just, I, I, I love all of them.、Um, but do you have any go to synths or bits of equipment that you, you gravitate towards? Yeah, I think less so out of sort of an aesthetic attachment and more out of just being lazy and slightly t e c h n o p h o b i c that,、uh, you know, it just ends <laughs> no, up、no. being the. 
same crop of like home studio stuff I've used for mm. like 10 years. It just feels very comfy. I think I'm quite a comfy creator. You know, I tend to get something that works adequately and then not get too mm. restless, which I guess has its advantages and disadvantages, right? But um, yeah, there's, there's also is, as well, I've been busting to ask you about this bit because mm. this is something I really like about the record is you have a piece called Nature Reset Gap, which is 30 seconds long, <laughs> which I <Yep>. absolutely <laughs> love. And the two, there's a two-part question I want to ask you about this one, which is, yeah. why is it there? And <laughs> is the record from that point onwards changed after the gap? Because I feel like I'm hearing it differently or feel like the record has a different hue after that point. But yeah, I wonder if you could tell me about that. Of course. Um <laughs> it's so funny that you mention it because um, I don't know if this is going to burst the illusion in any way, and maybe I don't know if this is something I should even say on the, on, on record. But okay. maybe you can figure you can you can choose. Yeah. Um, so the album was has come about through a performance at um, a project I created for WOMAD Online, which was a festival that Real World Studios and WOMAD run every year. Um, and because of the pan- uh, because of the situation of the pandemic, uh, the summer 2020 edition couldn't run in person. Um, so they created an online version where it was like an immersive audio experience, and they invited a few artists to uh, virtually perform, if you will. Like we all went to Real World and, and created something mm. for the festival, but it was all hosted online. And um, my lovely friend Dolly Jacobs, who's the head engineer there, very kindly invited me over and um, I jumped at the chance because I've always been so fascinated by binaural audio. I created the music at home and I took the stems to Real World and we recorded some uh, field recordings from the area. So I took a binaural head out with a lovely engineer there called Katie May, who's wonderful. And we recorded some yeah, there's n- sounds from the surrounding nature with the idea of hopefully allowing people to pop the headphones on and sort of inverse, immerse themselves in that environment, you know, wherever they were, if you're even in the middle of a city and you can't access nature very easily at that time, because mm. I, th- I think we were kind of still logged in at that time. Uh, mm-hmm. The idea was that you could just immerse yourself in nature and hopefully feel a bit more relaxed. So very long explanation to the question, <laughs> but basically what had happened, I think, there was that I'd... Um, because it was for the online festival, I'd create um, we, when we were uh, assembling all the parts together, and we'd assembled the songs and the field recordings. And there was a part where I reintroduced my name and the project for the listeners on the online festival. So that's where the nature reset gap was, where the spoken word was, I guess. Oh right! Um, wow. Yeah, but actually, when we took the spoken word out f- to make the album, it kind of felt relevant to keep the nature sounds there. Um, ah. But because we broke the album up into into tracks, um, to I, I guess to I I had, I had kind of considered it as one continuous piece, but obviously we needed to give track titles and sort of mark different po- points in the project. But and, and to me, you huh. know, it wasn't necessarily a track; it was a con- uh, like a segue, <laughs> right, <laughs> segue right. from one to the other. You know, so it's really funny, and I, and I love hearing your take on it because actually that takes on a whole new meaning and. I'm always so curious to see how something connects with with someone because once it's released, you know, it's not yours anymore. It's is well, not that it ever was mine, but you know, it's 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 for everyone. And yeah, I'm always really curious to see how different uh, different people connect with different elements of of anything. You know, so I, I really love that you said that. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> for, for giving right. that spin on it because now it means something completely different for me too. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, that was actually really nice to hear about rather than <laughs> crushingly disappointing so result okay oh, that's well that's great. good <laughs> <laughs> i thought it might have just stamped on stamped on some lovely sentiments there but nah but uh, it's bonus it's all bonus okay. um <laughs> so the, the f- final thing i want to talk about here is you did a uh-huh. show at south bank which actually was upcoming when we uh, originally planned to talk and now right, it's happened right, yeah. so yes how did it go <laughs> Oh, it was so much fun. Thank you. It was, um, I'm still kind of coming down from cloud nine. It was such a <laughs> magical experience for me to firstly, to be able to perform and collaborate with the LCO. Like it's been a dream because I'm such a big fan of theirs and I've seen a few shows of theirs, um, over the years and 
just the way that they approach and approach collaborations and projects is so innovative. And um, have you seen any of their shows before? I don't think I have. No, only videos, and they do look amazing. Oh, please go and see their shows. It's really mind blowing. Like they they have such a beautiful way to approach things and a very unique sound. You know, like mm. I think it's really outside the box how they approach things. I think and. Um, so yeah, so I think it was just such an honour for me, and especially to perform at the South Bank Centre as well. You know, it, it was like so many dreams yeah. into one. <laughs> so yeah. um, I was just kind of over the moon to be there at all. Um, but we started the concert with a guided meditation by my lovely friend, Clara Chima. She's a very dear friend and a really incredibly talented musician and singer. And uh, we thought it'd be really nice to sort of guide everyone to sort of a relaxed state, you know, and it's seated mm. as well. So hopefully it was quite, quite comfortable Um situation and after the guided meditation we played the album in its entirety with the lco with beautiful visuals created and live mixed by my wonderful friend thomas harrington Rawl. so it was yeah really really fun and i'd love to do it again um yeah <laughs> awesome well people should definitely check out the album i'll include a link in the show notes like i say it's given me a lot of incredibly lovely vibes over the past few weeks and i'm looking forward to digging into it more implore you all to do so too hinako let's go to your important records now so one mm. thing i'd like to ask at this point is how you thought about the word important when picking your list i mean was there a a way that you understood important in order to come up with mm. the three records that you did I think maybe a few different ways. I think mm. the first way maybe in terms of the artist's contribution to, to music and creation, just because I think the three albums that we'll, we're going to talk about, you know, I think are just so mind-blowingly unique and I just find them so mind-blowing and every time I listen to them, it I find something new. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a really transportative thing for me, um, and I'm sure everyone that listens to it will feel the same. Also, in a way that, I guess for me, when I first listened to it, it probably, well, it definitely inspired me and changed things in so many ways. Yeah, so I guess culturally important and important personally to me as well, because just in the ways of inspiration and uh, joy <laughs> when I listen to these records, yeah. <laughs> Great answer. So we'll go with whichever one feels natural to go with first have you got preference um maybe the knife nice. silent shout yeah cool yeah so maybe start with give me a little introduction as to why silent shout by the knife is important to you um so it was released in 2006 i think which is just before i went to college and yeah, so I guess I'm just trying to put myself back in the headspace of when I first heard it. So I was about 15, 16, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And it was just like something I'd never heard before. I think it was around the times of MySpace. And I just connected with their song Heartbeats as well. Mm -hmm. And I just felt, yeah, just completely mind blown that these sonics were possible. And, and also, they're, they're so mysterious, like at the time. And still, you know, there's not... A huge amount of information that you can find about them online mm. um and and i love that i think it's so fascinating and i think the, the further I, d I dived into their albums and obviously their subsequent albums too i just fell in love with them more and more and also their solo projects also um but yeah i i really can't get enough of the songs <laughs> and, um there's this one song called like a pen um which i think fascinated me the most because i think do you know it's, it's interesting because I, I don't think I've necessarily sought out you know you know when you look on forums and things and there's a lot of um different posts where people have researched how the sounds are made and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and in a way I kind of don't want to know <laughs> just because <I, laughs> for me it's such a magical entity that I'd write you know I'd, I'd just like to leave it up to my imagination but my imagination is telling me that this song like a pen sounds like a dripping tap and yeah and I was thinking, wow, they've created a beat out of this tap, you know? <laughs> and it just, yeah, it totally sparked my imagination, I think. Um, yeah, I think there's so many visual things that come come up when you're listening to their music. And, and also, interestingly, um, I think, I don't know if you feel the same. You know, you know, when you listen to something, like, musical, I feel like I often 
gravitate more towards the sound worlds and textures before the lyrics. Um, oh, always. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. So a lot of the time the lyrics don't... Well, obviously, I guess in the background they are going in <laughs> to my head. Yeah. But yeah. it takes me quite a long time to, yeah, to sort of understand what the lyrics are and I guess the message behind the song, which is so important, but I think a lot of the time I'm just so absorbed in what's going on sonically that um, I only really recently tuned into the lyrics, which is astonishing think you know considering how long i've been listening to the album for <laughs> yeah 100 percent. And, and yeah and noticing how important those lyrics are as well you know and really focusing in, into the into the message behind the songs but um yeah my first instant connection was just the sound worlds and how astonished and taken aback i was with what i was hearing it was just something i'd never heard before hmm. um, so yeah you said you just about to go into college so, um, do you remember, in fact, do you remember how you came into the knife? Was it through Heartbeats or what was your introduction? It was through Heartbeats, yeah. And I yeah. think it was probably through MySpace as well. I have a feeling that, I think that was probably the, por- the, the portal. <laughs> it was the portal <laughs> that I was discovering music through, <laughs> as, as I'm sure a lot of other people around that time. Um, you know, you'd have like your your song on your profile, and you'd have your yeah. top eight, and you'd put your favourite bands in the top eight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've totally. definitely just put my a stamp on my uh, <laughs> yeah on so right. yeah you, feeling quite in, ancient. But <laughs> you're in good company. Yeah, I, I was 1990, so this is all ringing very true for me. Right, right. So yeah, so we're a similar age, and uh, yeah. so yeah, so MySpace was the. Um, yeah, the discovery of lots of different bands, I think, definitely. Did you use it a lot? Yeah, I did. Though it was, it's weird now, isn't it? It seems like a very brief pocket of time, but that was yeah. your go-to. So, like, socially, that was where you'd listen to, like, three or four very low bitrate versions of, of bands mm. that may stick with you for a long time after that. Um, right. Yeah. And also the source of discovery of lots of other music that... You know, I think through. Th- I think a lot of the time, I'd I'd find a band that I love, and I'd go in the page and see who they were following, and exactly. Then it just goes down a wormhole, doesn't it? I think through the knife, I discovered IMX, which is Chris Cornell right. from Sneaker Pimps band, and then then the Sneaker Pimps came into my world. You know, just go down right. a wormhole because there's so many, so much amazing music that you're connected to. Um, totally. So yeah, it was a fun fun time. It's very different now. I don't even know if it's still a thing now, is it? Or I, I the last time I went on there because I think I had one of those. I wonder what MySpace is like now. Kind of moments, probably like during mm. a long work shift, and it's just unusable. I, I feel like they're trying to drive it into the ground. I don't know whether it's now. I think it's a Frankenstein of sort of different purposes and stuff. And right, it's quite. Sad. I wouldn't go on it, Hanako. To be honest, it's quite <laughs> sad. <laughs> it don't, don't I know. I'm kill scared. Those lovely no, memories. I'm not. <laughs> I've not approached it. Well, I did approach it once just to see if um, if I needed to delete anything <laughs> off a profile, if, if there was anything still public. But uh, luckily, I think it's all been wiped off, nice. which is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing yeah, worse than your like teenage pictures appearing online and you have no control over it. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, I found an old Twitter account the other day, which I promptly right. erased <laughs> <laughs> for the best. Um, oh, my God. So, so with the knife i mean what else were you listening to around the time that you discovered them uh for them to be like you know the thing that blow everything open for you i think i'm just trying to put myself back in my headspace i think it was <clears throat> definitely so definitely imx um robots in disguise that was another band that i was really into around that time uh-huh. um imogen heap portishead mm-hmm. i'm just trying to think who else I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that there were lots of, also lots of different genres as well. But I think, if I think back to the types of gigs, I was going, ah, oh, hang on, I've forgotten a really important one <laughs> for me. <Okay. laughs> um, Queen Adrena, which is a band I adored. And I actually saw live around that time as well. And I just remember feeling so empowered and inspired seeing them. Really, really amazing. Rasputina, a uh-huh. beautiful gothic cello trio. Um, yeah. With with the knife as well, is there a reason that this one became the important record? Because if I'm right, it's, Heartbeats is on the one prior to this, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So 
what was it about Silent Shout that makes it protrude as like the important one for you? Do you know, I think sonically I was so, um, I, yeah, it's a good question. I think I was really absorbed into this particular record sound was. I mean, I love all of them, but I think there was a shift in, for me and how I listened to it, I think there was a shift in sonic environment maybe i don't know how to really describe it but Mm. there were certain sounds in this record that i just really felt enveloped by and there's a track in particular actually that i just was obsessed with (laughs) and it even became my ringtone at the time it was uh, we share our mother's health i think which Uh is track four but just the vibe of it you know it's the beat and the energy and i don't know i just yeah I, i can't really put it into words but there is a certain feeling i have when i listen to this record and it really just takes me back to a certain time Mm. even though it feels timeless to me like you know it came out in 2006 but if it came on the radio now like no one would even question what date it it was released like it's so current it was so current you know and and the the same goes for all of their other even the previous albums from this album um Mm. which i think is really magical they're so ahead of their time and and actually interestingly that phrase definitely correlates to the other two albums that we're going to talk about today as well i think uh-huh. being ahead of their time i don't know it's just yeah it's really interesting for me um when you revisit something that is almost 20 years old now which is wild to think about no oh gosh yeah yeah also oh. sure <laughs> realizing how how far <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how far ago in our lives that was as well and you know whatever but um yeah yeah, really magical. Have you seen them live? Yes, well, only once, only once, sadly. But I have also seen the Array's live show, which was also incredible. But I saw the knife. I think it was maybe their last tour, and I saw them at Brixton Academy. Wow, cool. Uh, in twenty, oh god, I can't remember. I was living in Brixton at the time. I think it must have been. Oh, I don't know. I'll have to fact check, but probably about mm, eight. eight 10 years ago maybe uh-huh yeah have you ever seen them no i haven't like you i've seen fever i think i saw fever Ray at field day festival I, my my very vague memories are that it was it was a really like super visual mm. super cool live show just with a wish Thanks. i'd been more engaged for it but um because so beautiful the knife were am i right there was i think a lot of talk about their live shows at the time getting quite performative in a really interesting way like really sort of questioning a lot of what life could performance could be i have vague mm. notions in my head around this maybe like an aerobic quality to them as well I mean, what was it like yeah. seeing them you know what we were just saying about being ahead of their time i think again resonates with that because i think at the time i think i was still taking it in when i was seeing the show like it was a lot to process because i think it was sort of it made you question a lot of things in a really, really incredible way. Mm. Um, I think the anon- anonymity, eh, sorry, I can't say it, anonymity of it all. Uh-huh. There were so many performers on stage and you couldn't tell who was Karin and who was Olaf. And it was like one dancer will be singing the words and then you look across the stage and someone else will be starting to sing and you, and obviously it's Karin's voice. So you're like, hang on a sec, <laughs> who is Karin? And oh, then wow, it, so it was cool. like a beautiful art piece. And I think at the time, I, I feel like, I mean, I, I really appreciated it then, of course, like, it, you know, seeing my, one of my favourite bands ever live. But I think I appreciate it way more now, thinking back about it and yeah, and sort of understanding the sentiment behind it and also how bold it was, you know? I think... Mm. Um, you couldn't tell anyone's identity because it was sort of meant to, I guess, meant to sort of blur identities, perhaps. I don't know. It was just, you couldn't figure out who was who, what was what was happening, who was singing what, you know. And oh, so cool. I think it just really kept you on your toes. Yeah. Um, so I remember just being really blown away and sort of, um, yeah, it was a really wild experience. Really beautiful. And... I think it was also quite bittersweet for me because I finally got to see them and it was their last show. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> um, but also, you know, really, really special. Um, is it their last ever show, that one? I don't know. I, th- I think so. I, wow. I don't recall them. I mean, mind you, I think it was around the new album release, I think, at the time. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, I know, I don't know. That's, that's just what I remember anyway. It might yeah. be completely wrong, but yeah, from, yeah. from what I understood, yeah, it was their last tour. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask about this one is the um, vocals are super interesting. And mm. also as well, like, I'm not someone who's listened to ton of The Knife, but as soon as I hear the vocals and the way they're done and the processing, it's like, that's the knife it's mm. so incredibly distinctive um it's so unique yeah i mean i know as well with your new record and, and your material there is you know use of detuning and um you know repitching your voice in a way that i also hear within the knife and obviously these lines of influence aren't as crude as I'm trying to make them out to be for the sake of an interview. <laughs> but I mean, do you think any of your affection for treating the voice in that way uh, originates from your affection for the knife as well? Do you know, now you say that, it makes a lot of sense. I think you're definitely right. Because <laughs> I feel like a lot of the music that you absorb, you know, especially from a younger age, definitely has so much influence. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that I didn't consciously do it, but I'm sure that it has definitely shaped you know i was so inspired by them that i'm sure it's shaped maybe how i hear, I hear things or approach things in a way um mm. yeah it's interesting Naka, let's go to your second important record. So mm -hmm. which one do you want to go for now? I think we should go to Linda Perhex and Parallelograms. So, yeah, maybe let's start with, if you could give me a bit about why this one is important to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I first became aware of Linda's incredible work through my friend Georgia, who I was touring with at the time. And um, Georgia to me is like a, well, not only is she an incredible musician and artist, but she's also like a musical encyclopedia. And I feel like <laughs> through touring with G, I learned a lot about music. <laughs> right. And um, G used to work at Rough Trade West, actually. And um, honestly, her knowledge is incredible. <laughs> um, so G, I think, maybe put this album on in the car or something when we were on the road. And I remember hearing the title track for the first time being like, oh my goodness, what is this beautiful music? Mm. Um, and then the more I read about it and the more I found out later on, it just became even more fascinating to me. Um, so apparently, um, so the, I think this was originally released in 1970. And in the late 1960s, I think Linda was, and I think still is working as a dental hygienist. And one of the clients was an Oscar winning film composer called Leonard mm. Rosenman. And Linda, I think, had made him a demo tape of her work and he loved it and wanted to work together. So this beautiful album was, was the result of that collaboration. And apparently, the time it was released, um, it didn't see much acclaim, which is wild to me, just because it's such a beautiful and mind-blowing record. Yeah. Um, so actually, Linda returned back to her work and didn't really work in music until three decades later. <laughs> and it was found by this indie label in New York called Wild Places. And they said, apparently they wrote to her and said, oh, we've reissued your record. People absolutely love it. Um, yeah, and I guess then from then, perhaps, um, I mean, obviously, this is just from me reading articles. I don't, you know, I don't know Linda or like, I don't know the label or anything yeah. like that. But just from what I've read, it, it appears that she returned back to music and then since released an album, uh, a new album, you know, over 30 years later. Um but again, like how we were saying before, the idea of being ahead of your time and creating something that resonates so deeply with people 30 years on mm -hmm. um, and then taking on a whole new meaning, I think is really fascinating to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other thing I read about this one is that it sounds like part of its failure to penetrate initially was because it was like, mixed for and mixed and pressed for am radio 
mm. which sounded like quite a blunt instrument. I don't know much about the mechanics of that, but apparently all the lovely detail of the record was completely squashed, you know, mm. which I guess didn't help. Which it's is such a shame. <laughs> yeah, right. There's so much going on here. I mean, so so you heard the title track initially mm-hmm. and then sort out the record. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, how did that then shape your perception of her work? Because, you know, I've given it a couple of spins now. It's quite a diverse record. I mean, did Definitely. the initial f- feelings you got from Parallelograms persist as you checked out this this whole album? Definitely. It's a real journey, isn't it? Like a real sonic journey. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's just really interesting to hear the creations of... Um, of Linda's particular, uh, what's the word? Inspiration at the time, and mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just again very timeless for me. Like it could totally, well, it totally does. I mean, obviously it exists now, but as in it could have easily been made today. Even though there is such a lovely, I don't know, there's a very nostalgic feel about it. But, yes, um, totally. But also there is a song. I think it's called "Hey, Who Really Cares," who I think might might be a bonus track, perhaps. Yeah, I think it's a bonus track on on the album, but it's just so beautiful. <laughs> I can't I can't quite put into words. You know, sometimes it's hard, isn't it, to describe how much something means to you because it's such a, a like a visceral feeling rather Absolutely. than a Absolutely. Um you know, and the same goes with a knife in Beverly Glenn Copeland's record. It's just how it reacts with your body, I think is a really incredible thing. Totally. Um yeah, it's the central problem of this podcast is the inarticulability of really important <laughs> music <laughs> i didn't think that one through um, no no no. It's, it's really interesting to to voice actually because then it makes you think about what it is that's so important mm. in the particular music to you but um yeah i think it's the feeling more than anything and how something makes you feel after you've bathed in the sounds for the entirety of the album yeah you yeah. kind of come out the other side a different person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really interested as well because, you you know, you mentioned the fact that these important records, kind of you continue mm. to get new stuff out of them as you go. Mm. Um, what does that look like with Parallelograms? I mean, how has your relationship with this record changed over the time that it's been in your company, if it has at all? Hmm, that's a good question. Um... I think just really immersing myself in the sound world and I I don't really know how to voice it really. Um, Mm. I feel like Linda, I say Linda like we know each other, I'm just using first name (laughs) basis, but uh, Linda's lyrics and her soaring voice just floats for me. Like, you know, it just is something so comforting, Mm -hmm. like like an audio blanket, but... I think the more I listen to it, the more connected I feel with it, maybe. Because you kind of, obviously, I guess, absorb the words, even if it's subconsciously for me, because I don't necessarily attach to the lyrics as much. Mm. But um, I think with anything as well, when you listen to something a lot, when you when you love it so much, it's sort of, yeah, it, it is comforting, isn't it? When you, when you hear those, even the opening chord or the opening sound or whatever it is, you're like, oh, okay, immediately yes. I'm here again and I'm back. And yeah. I think that more than anything, just hearing the sonics of it and feeling enveloped and protected. <laughs> mm, yeah, 100%. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued, like, if you have a, a record like that, are there places or mm. situations that you like to play the most? Or I, I can imagine, in fact, maybe the appeal is that they work anywhere because they're so familiar. But, yeah, where do you listen to your you know, records like this that are like a real balm for you? I think rather than where, I think it's how, like usually on headphones for me. Mm. So it's really connected directly to my ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as, as connected as you can be. Um, I really love using sort of in earbuds or like, or, or, you know, or overhead headphones, but um, it, then it just feels really massive, you know, and um yeah, so it doesn't really matter where I am, I guess, as, as long as I can just switch off and into that world for a little while. But sometimes mm. it's nice to listen to it on walks or things, and 
Because I do feel like it's very deeply rooted in nature as well, this record. And I feel like being yes. outside and taking in, you know, like a warm breeze and being among the trees. I, th- I think that's sort of the... And also, I guess, Linda's based in... Well, at the time, at least, was based in Topanga Canyon, I think. Or mm. around there, at least in California. Um, so sort of yeah envisaging those vibes <laughs> yeah 100% I don't yeah. know where the closest uh, cl- closest place to that would be in the UK but uh, <laughs> yeah yeah a sort of somewhere you can envisage that world I think would be ideal I mean, do you have a, a favourite track now? I think it's got it actually I know it's the bonus track but I think it's Hey Who Really Cares now that I've heard it so many times I, <laughs> I think there's something about yeah, I don't know. It just really connects with me. <laughs> Wicked. Cool. How about you? Is there anything that you that jumped out of you when you first heard the, the, the album? The title track is unreal. That melody yeah. is so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so nice. Like, because it sounds so evocative of shape as well. Like, and mm. because it's not, I hope I'm remembering this right, but it's sort of got this rolling sense of not being entirely in 4-4 four, four or rhythms sliding against each other, you know. Mm. The fact it's not a four-sided shape that's referring... Well, no, sorry, it is, bloody hell. But he's got this... <laughs> no, <laughs> we can cut this out because I don't know my freaking geometry. <laughs> no, but there's lots, of, there's lots of shapes mentioned in the song, isn't there? That's so. true. Uh, thank you for the <laughs> you same. You are definitely right. <laughs> yeah, so it's got this sort of like... Um, yeah, just this very strange shape to it, that melody, mm. which I really like. Do you know, it feels to me like you're looking through a um, kaleidoscope or something. Oh, is that the word? Lovely. You know, when you have... Yes. Is it kaleidoscope when there's lots of shapes kind of rotating around? Yeah, like you um, twist it like almost like a little... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Like a sonic version of that for me. Been wishing there was someone else that could be Hey now, who really cares? Hey, won't somebody listen? Let me say what's been on my mind Can I bring it out to you? I need someone to talk to And no one else will spare me Inaka, let's go to your final important record now. So, yeah, if you could give me the name of it and then a bit about why it's important to you as well. Of course. So the last record is Beverly Glenn Copeland's Keyboard Fantasies. Um, Again, an album that was so ahead of its time. I I find it so fascinating that it first came out in 1986 and then was reissued in 2017. So again, almost 30 years later, similarly to the situation with Parallelograms. And again, just such a timeless, timeless record. You can just feel Beverly's beautiful connection Mm. with the synths and the sonics. You can really immerse ourselves into his world. Like it's such a magical experience mm. um i actually have you seen the film about beverly's um, i was gonna ask you because i haven't but is it good oh my god it's so lovely and you can just feel the love pouring it pouring out of beverly it's so lovely like it, he's such a magnificent person like i, mm. I can't put into words how much love i feel <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely to i know i've said lovely a million times but honestly <laughs> I'm, st- I'm smiling thinking about it like it's such a beautiful 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 film talking about his life and also following him on a recent tour where actually he was playing at Cafe Otto which is down the road from where I live and it's kind of wild I wish oh. I'd known about the gig because I oh, you're kidding. would love to have been there you know it was, it was probably a few years ago now maybe four or five years ago or something but just yeah magic and also the start of Beverly's career where he was I think a composer on Sesame Street yeah, and you know composing lots of beautiful beautiful music and then this album you know came out but again somehow because it was so early, you know it was, it was so ahead of its time like I think the connection or you know I'm sure that so many people connected with it but it's just it was so fascinating to me that it only really fully resonated with everyone 30 years later yeah do you have any thoughts as to like why that is like what was culturally chiming that wasn't previously i wish i had a clever answer for that but i have no (laughs) idea like to me it's just wild that um i don't know maybe it's to do with the music around that time and 
I guess, culturally what people are used to hearing. And if anything's outside of that comfort zone, then maybe it's, I don't know. Like, yeah. you, you know, but even if you think about now, we're, there's so much music happening everywhere and we have access to everything. So it's more about carving out what exactly it is we want to hear. And it's, it, yeah, it's just a vast world out there. And yeah. even so in this world now, it's it's being so celebrated. So mm. it's, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. Um, I guess now, cult, you know, it's even when we think about our MySpace days or, you know, or whatever, like it, in the days of streaming now, there's so much access to everything at our fingertips. So it's interesting that now that these mind-blowing records from 30 years ago are, <laughs> yeah. are, are resonating even more than they were at the time. You know, I, I find that really interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if there's like a real charm when everything has like a newness to it there's like a constantly renewing newness that to have something undiscovered from so long ago is mm. really charming to come across in amongst all of that yeah for sure do you remember how you first came across keyboard fantasies that's a very good question um i'm just trying to think i think i first actually i first became aware of Beverly Glenn Copeland's name when um, I was touring with my friend Kay, Kay Tempest and La Fonda um, was opening for Kay and her set was just magical and mind-blowing and she actually covered Don't Despair from Beverly's previous album. I thought I'd love to discover more of his music and I did some research and found all of his other releases. This one in particular, I mean all of Beverly's records are just stunning but this one in particular I think really resonated with me and now I've seen mm. his film and understood more about his life yeah it's just become even more special <laughs> i mean are there any tracks as well specifically that kind of protrude as as favorites for you of course ever new i think let us dance as well like they're all so mm. joyful every song just boosts your mood and i feel like i just can't stop smiling <laughs> when i listen to this <laughs> album it's such a beautiful energy uplifter and yeah, I really, I really um, would recommend watching the film because it just gives a whole new meaning to the album. And to see Beverly tour it 30 years later with a group of musicians that he's connected with in later years, you know, it's not like a band that Beverly has toured with forever. It's um, it's for this reissue, this tour, and they've just got this beautiful connection. But I think there's so much love for Beverly and you can really feel that in this film and in this album, mm. of course. But he's such an incredibly inspiring person and I can't wait to hear more of his magic. Yeah, yeah. I think I read like a wire piece on him. Mm. That was like a cover story a little while back, and I was like, "He was such a delight." For that to come mm. through in a written article as well as yeah, also absolutely. Ev every picture of him. There's a few on an online article I found where he's one face amongst twenty. And you mm. instantly pinpoint his face because he's beaming. Yeah, like, you're so, so right. So brightly, you're so right, and I think that beaming. <laughs> That that beam just shines through his music as well. You mm. know? It's yeah. a really positive, beautiful energy. And yeah, I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean as well, the record was recorded using only two bits of equipment, right? A DX seven and a TR seven oh seven. Yeah, um, I think I think so, yeah. I'm wondering if because we spoke obviously about the fact that three synthesizers were at the base of of your new record I mean does this mm -hmm. use of restriction or limitation ap appeal to you I mean within Beverly's work for starters but also generally is there something you find uh, interesting about working with restriction you know I think it definitely does I think at first maybe I wasn't so conscious of it but I think having restrictions makes you think outside the box more with what you have I think mm -hmm. and um, I think a lot of the time the music that I create or I've released has come from like little noodles of me trying to understand how a synthesizer works <laughs> for example you know for, for example when I first got the profit I'd plug it in and press record and just play with it and just see what sounds might come out and then a lot of them become demos for songs so most of it comes from experimenting with something that I'm trying to 
get to know, if that mm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. And most of the, most of the recent album is that <laughs> actually wow. it's, mainly, it's mainly synth demos um, that I'd sort of squirreled away on a hard drive and I guess found a new purpose for later on. Hmm. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, that actually ties in with another thing I wanted to ask, which is connected to mm-hmm. Beverly's album, which is mm-hmm. his voice is just. Stunning. Top. Oh my <laughs> word! I uh, know, because <laughs> it doesn't feel like it, it, I, I was quite happy to listen to the opening track without any voice until I heard his voice, and then I was like, "Oh mm. goodness me, this is so enriching." Um, you know, we were talking about healing frequencies earlier. Mm. I feel like this whole album is full of that. Right. It's, uh, yeah, there's something there's something that transforms when you listen and yeah. Mm. I'm even I'm just smiling so much even yes. talking and thinking about it <laughs> which is enough in itself, you know, like just the effect that it has when you think about this album and of Beverly is is profound. It's 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 so nice. The yeah, I I, I wondered when you hold up going back to a, a journey briefly, when you hold mm. up these synth uh, demos to work on them again mm. uh, another thing I really like about your record is just how the voice is woven in um, oh, it's stunning you. because it's you know sometimes it's in a way which I guess is has a more textural feel to it other times it really drags these pieces into the sort of domain of song mm. and that push pull is lovely so I'm, I'm wondering how you approached adding the voice to these since like how did you i mean also as well because compared to the material i've heard you do previously i, I wonder mm. whether it nece- necessitated a, a different approach to your voice as well when you were doing this one um <laughs> i feel like you know my music better than me <laughs> um <laughs> honestly i think it probably came a lot of the time, I think it comes from my shyness to use my voice as a, I don't know, there's something, because I'm not necessarily a vocalist or anything, I'm more of a keys player. So mm. I think a lot of the time it came from me trying to process the voice so it sounds more like a texture than a, right. a lead part, if you know what I mean. And I think on, on the previous EP that I released, again, it was me trying to hide behind all these effects, you know. Right. Again, maybe maybe now that you mention it, maybe there is something that I was so inspired by the knife to create this sort of that EP in particular was um I think came about from a time of me trying to figure out how to navigate through these migraines I was experiencing and trying to make a sonic representation of that. So I think the the creepier the voice sounded, the better really oh, wow. <laughs> for that release in particular. Right. But for this one I think um I think a lot of it comes from the shyness of, yeah, presenting, you know, a a vocal line or something like that. But ironically, I think it's probably the album that the vocal is most prominent on as well. (laughs) So I don't really know is the answer, but I think, (laughs) uh, yeah, I think I think the thing is using vocals as a texture more than a, a lead line is maybe how I'd approach blending it with synths and um mm. so that it sort of sits together rather than on top um uh-huh. uh and also when i when i record it and also when i perform it live it's more again going through tons of effects pedals <laughs> it's a nice safety blanket for me really. but uh <laughs> but i think i'm more interested in how to process audio rather than yeah i don't know like how, you know the fun you can have by passing it through lots of different electronics or seeing how you can yeah manipulate sounds weird but how you can manipulate audio or like how you can change the effects um yeah welcome the bud the summer blooming flower welcome the child whose hand I hold
one other question I had for you, Hanako, is sure. how music comes into your life now. Like, how do you tend to purchase or, or, or listen to music? Like, what does being a music listener look like for you day to day? Day to day. Um... <laughs> I'm just trying to think because it's so part of our, all of our lives, isn't it? I'm just trying yeah, to think how. Yeah. Uh, I guess radio a lot. Um, using Bandcamp, Bandcamp's been such an amazing resource to uh, to discover new music, especially mm. um, you know in, in different sound worlds that you might be interested in. Um, recommendations through friends mixes. I love listening to friends mixes and oh, nice. discovering new things through there. Um, obviously vinyl I love yeah just having there's something so important about having the artwork together with the music as well mm. and and seeing a body of work how the artist intends to really sit like there's so much thought that's gone into every detail so it's so nice to celebrate that mm -hmm. and to have it as one complete thing obviously you know having everything digitally is also so helpful when you're out and about or you know you can't really walk around with a whole crate of <laughs> Final right. with you on you at all times, <laughs> although I guess we come from like CD Walkman era, so oh, we are time. used to that. Yeah. But um, but yeah, just having access to to be able to see the artwork when you're listening to something and read the liner notes and I don't know, there's such a yeah, like the intention behind the whole record in terms of the artwork that's been created for it and the lyrics and it's just nice to sort of be absorbed in that artist world when you're listening to something so i think record's been a lovely way to connect mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know i think that those are the main ways that i yeah connect with you know and also radio stations like worldwide fm and nts and mm -hmm. resonance fm there's so many amazing online radio stations as well like it's it's, yeah, I think there's such an abundant source of music, isn't there, everywhere? Oh, We're quite amazing. lucky in this stage. <laughs> yeah, hundred um, percent, and abundance of like human curated music as well, which is lovely, isn't it? As a, a, a counterbalance to stuff which is algorithmically. Right, yeah, together. definitely. Rather than algorithmic, something that has been created by someone that you love is, yeah, I think a really. Um, it just you know it sh really shapes that experience, doesn't it? Totally, and um, as a CD listener back in the day did you have mm. one of those cd like wallets with like 30 cds oh, yeah. in <laughs> yeah do you know i recently found one of mine it was uh it had a cartoon orange it was it was a cartoon <laughs> orange that you unzipped and it had like a little leaf <laughs> on the zip um and i found all these mixtapes <laughs> that oh, i made at college <laughs> what did you listen back uh, well, I've got, do you know, the sad thing is I don't have a way to listen back. Oh, no, that's a lie. I have a CD player in the car. <laughs> so I probably could, actually, now Now I think about it. Wow. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's wild thinking capsule. back about. I know. Or even, like, mini discs or floppy discs. Or... Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I did have a CD wallet that you could kind of carry as a satchel, which was made mm. me obviously the envy of my friends because it looked yeah. amazing <laughs> it's like but, you're going to work but with all your favorite cds <laughs> yeah it's serious business but, um yeah i definitely did uh i was also awful with cd care so a oh, lot of mine got I was scratched just thinking the same mm. yeah it'll get to like a certain point and i'll just keep skipping and you'll be like no <laughs> oh yeah i really was terrible for that and also putting things in the right cases as well so oh yeah i think that's Easter i think hunts. that's uh global thing right <laughs> I, I, I hope so you know in our um, survey of two this is already looking like a global thing but yeah yeah, yeah. but it's also kind of a fun hunt to find <laughs> the cd because then you're like oh well i wasn't expecting to find this but i listened Ex to this instead you know exactly that's it yeah, yeah. You, you get some very unusual like color combinations as well with the cd sat in this you know yeah, like yeah, all yeah. black metal case and then you've got this I don't know. Yeah, it's got its own charms. But um, Hinako, thank you so much. This has been awesome to talk about your record. And these three records as well, none of which I've heard, but three that I would definitely be going back to again, especially that oh, Beverly amazing. Glenn Copeland one. So thank you. Oh, yeah, it's just magic. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been so nice to, yeah, to chat with you and to sort of dive into these three albums that, yeah, mean so much. To everyone <laughs> it's such a yeah 
lovely journey of records, these three. Awesome. And to everyone listening, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.